Just a quick, quick background about me. I'm, I'm on my last year as an electrical engineer at Cal Poly Pomona. Um, I do some work for JPL, although I'm not here representing JPL in one no way, shape, or form. Um, and this has been a hobby of mine and a lot of my friends. Um, so I'm here to talk about it. Um, so I'm just going to describe the first and second. So this, this talk is split in two. The first half is going to be about near, like, near space exploration and um, just if you want to ever build one on your own, what is involved in building a high altitude balloon. The second half is going to be the history that our hackerspace and all space labs had and all the balloons we've launched and all our experiences. So, <laughs> all right, so what is near space? Um, the thing is, space itself isn't exactly defined, and people will argue with you, and we're not going to go there. So we're going to loosely define space starting around 330,000 feet. Um, and you really can't get a satellite in orbit in there because there's still too much atmospheric drag. So your, your satellite will come crashing down to Earth. Um, however, that's where they say it starts. And, just be, and because near, uh, space has a fuzzy line, so does near space. Um, so be, most people consider near space starting around 100,000 feet, or about double the altitude of a jetliner. So what does it look like? It looks like this. It's, it's a it's very beautiful. It almost looks like you're in space, but you're really not. Um, and I want to say, back in 2009, I saw this picture uh, that Natrium42, uh, he's one of the guys on IRC, and he's, he's had a, a bunch of high-altitude balloons, uh, posted this picture, and I was like, wow, that is awesome. Like, I want to do that. And the, the, the joke goal was make it a wallpaper. Um, so go up there, snap a cool photo, make that the wallpaper, and then move on to some new project. So what ended up happening was, uh, well actually no, I'm going to talk about what does it have. A uh, high altitude balloon consists of a balloon, a parachute, and a payload. Uh, your payload contains all the cameras and the radio gear and whatnot that report back to where it is. Uh, the balloon takes you up there and the parachute helps you not crash into the earth at terminal velocity. So the concept behind it is, uh, as I said, you tie a balloon to a uh, parachute and then your payload below. You fill it, you fill the balloon just enough to get uh, the proper amount of lift. And these balloons are actually really special balloons, and I'll talk about that in a few slides. Um, you do a little bit of math, you figure out how much you need to fill these balloons up, and it rises at a fairly constant velocity. And um, based on your math, you can actually calculate when it will pop. And then once the balloon pops, because it's expanded, because as the air, the pressure decreases, the balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the balloon pops and it comes flying down, some wind passes through the parachute and eventually you have enough wind to slow yourself down, and you come to a nice gentle glide and land on the ground. The other type of high altitude balloon is when you slightly underfill it, and you have to be very careful with how you fill your valve, your, your, the balloon. Um, and you really have to measure the neck lift or the lift of the balloon very, very carefully. But if you do it just right, you can get it to go up and become buoyant. Where you haven't exactly filled up the balloon with enough lift to keep going higher, um, but you haven't underfilled it so that it comes back down to the ground. So you reach buoyancy and you just kind of float. Um, and that could go on for many days. So why would you do this? Um, for fun, mostly. Uh, it's a big radio challenge if you're into like RF design or designing circuit boards, um, building scientific instrumentation and testing that, uh, taking pretty pictures. Uh, weather data, a lot of how the, the, the history of positive ballooning really came from weather. They launched these radio songs and let them fly around and they could figure out the profile of at w what, what kind of wind do we have at each altitude. Um, and then you can, if there's a solar eclipse going on, no one's done this yet, by the way. So if you have a camera and want to do this, capture a solar eclipse. Is my volume okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, RF hackery, which if if you realize you're at radio horizon to everything, and milliwatts are enough to talk to stuff, so I'll leave that to you guys to think about. <laughs> um, so there's several manufacturers. The big ones being Kmot and Hui. I think I believe it's the Chinese. One. Um, they make these Totex balloons. It's a special kind of latex balloon um, that's engineered to shred it and disintegrate when it pops. And there's calculators online that you can figure out how much helium you need to put into these things. 
Uh, you, you input in your payload mass and what you're expecting, uh, the what local boom you're, you're going to choose, and it spits out the ascent rate. And it can cost anywhere from $35 if it's a really small balloon to 200 and more, actually. It's now actually above that. Uh, lifting gas, you can use either hydrogen or helium. Hydrogen is a bit scary to deal with, but if you take the proper safety measures, it's not too terrible. Uh, you just have to have the proper regulators and the proper safety measures. Um, helium is, oh no, the nice thing about hydrogen is that it's cheap, it's super cheap. Helium on the other hand is extremely expensive, but it won't kill you. It can't kill you. They can't, if you inhale it and then hold it in and then suffocate to death, but you really have to try it. <laughs> Don't say it can't kill you. That's true. Fine. Can. Anything can kill you. So <laughs> um, That's a disclaimer here. Um, and again, you're going to need the proper regulators to do that. It's a bit expensive, but you could rent these things from balloon stores. So it's not like you need to buy the helium tank, although renting is expensive. Parachutes. Um, there's this one company called Spherachute that actually sells a parachute that has a little tie-on point for your balloon. So you can tie on there and let the balloon go up. And the parachute is taut because there's, um, you know, the, the tension from the balloon lifting up and the payload's mass uh, means that the parachute's not deployed. So when it goes up, it pops, it comes falling back down, the parachute just deploys itself. You don't need to design like a deployment mechanism, it's just, you don't need any of that. And then there's equations to figure out um, what speed you'll be coming down at. So the payload itself, and I'm, the next few slides are going to be about the payload. Uh, the payload itself consists of um, a camera. Uh, you can put in a camera. Uh, you're hot, take some pictures. <laughs> yeah, the wording of that. Um, <laughs> the payload science, you could do uh, temperature, barometric pressure, guider counters. Like People have flown all sorts of crazy stuff on it. Um, the professional ones have flown full-blown telescopes. Uh, but this is... I'm more focusing on the amateur side, uh, what you can do for less than a grand, less than $500. Um, and then radios. The, the, one, the most important thing is the world is really, really big. These payloads aren't, you're not going to be able to chase it down visually and then find it on the ground. So these payloads need to know where they are and they need to report to you where they are. Um, and I'm going to get into that in the next slide. So what else is there? And two-way communication, some people will actually put um, little pyrotechnics on their balloon, so they can command to it over the radio, hey, pop the balloon right now, I want you to burst at this altitude so you can land at a certain place. Um, the radios, there's many different ways of approaching this. If you're a ham radio operator, it's really easy to get a license. Um, you can use the APRS system, which is a radio system, there's all these radio towers all around the US, actually all around the world. Uh, that are listening on these specific frequencies. And if you construct a packet correctly, and you transmit it on this frequency with the correct modulation, um, they will take in the uh, GPS data and report it online. So you can launch a balloon and then just go home and have a beer and watch where your balloon goes. Uh, there is another system that's not popular in the US, and I think you guys would really like it. Uh, it's mostly based on, how many people here are familiar with DLFL Digi? One guy, yes. Okay, cool. Right. Uh, it's it's a it's a nice program. Uh, I think I think it was originally made for Linux. It's it's there's a lot of Linux users who support it. Um, it's a program that takes in an SDR like a, a software defined radio. You can tune to a frequency, and you can actually decode um, these packets in different modulation formats. The most popular one is radio teletype, which is a very very old method of. You have one frequency and you have another frequency. If you're on one, it means a one. If you're on another, it means a zero, and then one zero one zero one zero one. And you just do it between them really, really quickly, and you can spit out binary data. Um, there's other modulation modes. It's not the only one, uh, but this is really popular in Europe because Europe, it's actually illegal. Uh, in the UK, it's illegal to use APRS for flying crafts. You can use it on the ground, but you can't use it in the air. So the, the UK invented this whole crazy system just to do that. Um, cell phones, um, I want to, like I've seen so many people use cell phones, they're really not reliable. You don't have good cell coverage above a couple, like a couple thousand feet. Like cell, you overload the cell towers and no one wants to talk to you and you're too far away. Uh, when you get really, really high up, the power just drops off, the frequency is bad. So, and the antennas are pointing down. Yeah, they're pointing, exactly, they're directional antennas because you're like, why would you cover the sky? Um, <laughs> exactly. So, I would highly... Because the aliens are using for Yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. Um, and then the other, the other system is Spot, which I also don't rec I recommend totally against, but people have used it, and it's about 50% success rate. It's a satellite-based like uh, GPS tracker. So like if you're a hiker and you're lost, you can just press a button and then a helicopter show up. Um, but you can use it in different modes. Uh, you can use it in like non-emergency modes. So you can track stuff. And then there's RDF beacons, which are just basic FM transmitters that just go beep. And then you use directional antennas to kind of triangulate where that beep is coming from. So if you aim it that way, you hear it. But if you don't hear it from over there, you kind of figure out where it is. But that requires a very, very dedicated team who's trained and willing to go through that. It's not something one person could do. Um, just real quick about APRS. Uh, in the US, it's on 144.390 megahertz. Uh, it uses audio frequency shift keying. So one audio, it does, I think, 1200 hertz or 1600 hertz or 2200 hertz, I forget what it is. It just switches between the two really quickly. And the uh, protocol is AX25. Um, for those who know different radio protocols, uh, that's a very common uh, protocol. And at 1200 baud, so it's fairly slow. You're not going to be sending a whole lot of data through this, but this system isn't designed to handle large packets. It's mostly just position. Uh, position and altitude, and then you have, you have some space in the comment uh, payload to just put in temperature data and whatever you want to put in there. Uh, and then you can use an SDR, you can use, um, there's Android apps that now do it. You can plug in your ham radio's audio out into your Android phone, it decodes it for you. Um, a TNC if you really have, if you want to go through that. Uh, the basic beacon, so if you were going to design a radio around this, would be a GPS module that takes in the GPS signal. And the GPS is usually in an NMEA form, uh, uh, an NMEA packet, and you, you can choose, you get to ask the GPS for you know, its position and altitude in different fancy ways. And then that goes to a microcontroller, which compress, or, uh, transforms that into an APRS packet, constructs that APRS packet, maybe it shoves in the temperature and the barometric pressure and all that stuff into that packet. And then sends it to a radio, which is tuned to the correct frequency, and that keys out into the world. And then these towers all around the uh, US pick it up and report it online, and then you can watch it fly around. Is there, is there, isn't there like a limitation on GPS like altitude? Very good question. <laughs> GPS is limited to 60,000 feet, normal GPS. So in order to do that, um, you need a GPS that has something called flight mode, where you choose what you want. Do you want to have your velocity limited or do you want your position limited? So this is pretty much to prevent you from building cruise missiles. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's really it it oh, easy. If you guys ever get a chance, look into GPS. It is one of the coolest no. <laughs> things that's ever been designed, like in my book. Like just the way it's been all constructed, it's just genius. Um, so yes. There are GPSs out there that you can purchase uh, that are designed to have flight mode enabled. So you can say, I'm, I'm a flying craft, and you can't go above like a couple hundred miles an hour, um, but it, it, it unlocks the 60,000 feet and gives you up to, I want to say, hundred and no, 200,000 feet or so. So two thirds of the way to space. Um, so here's a Habix 2, which is, Habix is the, uh, I'm going to get into in the second half of this. Uh, this is the one of the payloads we made. This is the radio system. It had a GPS, uh, which over a serial cable went over to a PIC microcontroller, which took the GPS, constructed the packets, and then put it into a little amplifier, and then out through the antenna, and now it goes into the world. Um, but these are really bulky. This thing was two watts, which is a lot of power. When you're line of sight, you don't need that much power. So I, I ended up designing another one, which uh, contains it just powered by a single AA battery at like 10 milliwatts. It had a GPS and it uses a U-Blox GPS which has that specific chip actually supports flight mode. Um, and then an ET Mega 328 which you might be familiar with if you use Arduino. Uh, and then that goes out to a radio which you can't see it's under it. There's a little uh, radio module uh, that you can just, you can toggle a pin if it's zero or one, it switches those frequencies for you so you can actually key out uh, the APRS and it's nice and compact. The thing is really small. It's like about that big. So <laughs> there's a problem when you get up to these altitudes. Uh, it's very, very cold. Uh, it can get down to negative 60 Celsius. And on the ground, like where we launched, um, it was very hot. It's like it could get up to 40 degrees Celsius. 
and near space is almost a vacuum. It's one percent of our atmosphere. So the three forms of heat transfer are convection, conduction, and radiation. And convection goes out the door. There's no air to transfer heat, so components can easily overheat. Um, so if you, like your chip is a power amplifier and it's generating a bunch of heat, that heat has nowhere to go other than through the PCB board, through the body, and then out of the deep space. But there's a lot of thermal resistance through that. And then, so anyway, I'm going to get into that a little bit. Then there's mountains, lakes, volcanoes. So you got to pick your launch and landing locations very, very carefully. And I'm going to get into how you figure out your landing location in just a bit. Um, lots of winds, flight time can be from anywhere from, usually these things last from an hour to two hours, sometimes more, it depends how much you filled your balloon, how slowly it rises and how slowly it falls. Um, and these are the conditions electronics don't like, so when you design it, you really have to uh, consider uh, the conditions and design around that. Uh, so last year, I actually gave a, a talk at, in the UK, at the UK Haas, uh, International High Altitude Balloon Conference, which it's like 50 people, but the, it's a very tight community. It's all these amateurs who build this sort of stuff. And I did a quick project on replicating the conditions of near space in your living room. And essentially I designed this PCB tee with, you know, uh, acrylic caps and a vacuum pump, a lamp, and some dry ice. So. This is kind of like an inside view of what's going on. Um, to prevent conduction from having the outside effect, the payload directly, I held it by a little fishing line, uh, put some dry ice on there and a cloth, and then put that against the insulation of, of the actual uh, balloon, or the, the payload. As you can see, the payload is really tiny in this one. It's just some foam wrapped together and taped together and then stick some dry ice on it. So that gets it cool, and then you can simulate the sun if you really wanted to with a light bulb. And then a vacuum pump to, to evacuate all out all that uh, air, because then you have condensation, humidity, and all sorts of horrible things happen. And you may be thinking, well, dry ice sublimates creates gases and all that fun stuff. Um, the vacuum pump actually worked really, really well. So the second it sublimated, the the carbon dioxide was immediately pulled out, and the pressure in there was just like the pressures that you'd be expecting at those altitudes. So that way, you could simulate wind by throwing your payload down the stairs. Um, and if it survives, then it's good to go. Um, <laughs> the temperature is a bit more tricky, and it's usually a good idea to have a bunch of temperature probes, making sure the payload's OK, um, seeing how much, knowing if you were to make this side 60 degrees, what's going to be on the other, or 60 degree, negative 60 degrees, what's going to be the inside temperature. And then uh, make sure you spec your parts. The electronic components you pick are spec to those to survive those temperatures and operate under those temperatures. More importantly, um, vacuum pump. I bought this like cheesy vacuum pump off of Amazon for fifty bucks. That goes down to very very low pressures. Um, I have all these links by the way. So if you're interested in a specific thing, all these links are on my blog and on my website. Um, and I'll have that link later afterwards. Um, and EMC, another very important thing, electromagnetic compatibility. Um, if you have multiple radios talking, you don't want one radio talking over the other or hurting the other. Or maybe your radio goes off and then suddenly your sensors start going crazy because there's an electric field across something that's very, very sensitive to it. So it's very important to do EMC testing. Make sure you put your radios uh, close to each other. Um, you probably would want to do some math around that, um, but if you're into that field, Probably already know a lot about that. So why do you need to, uh, to simulate the sun? Then? Is that the light? Bulb? That was kind of more for fun at the time, because uh, I wanted to see what like the effects of how hot a surface would get if there is no convection. And I actually got that that foam up to like sixty degrees Celsius because heat just keeps getting dumped into it, and eventually, whoops! Now yeah, I should have done that. I hope all your levels are fine. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's. The point is, that, so it's a big game of heat transfer um, when when you're dealing with trying to simulate an environment. So deep space itself is a very big uh, radiative void. Like you radiate into this deep, cold, negative 200 Celsius um, background. The sun itself provides a lot of heat. The Earth's ground IR provides a lot of heat. Um, so when you're on like the dark side of Earth, whenever that happens. Um, 
<laughs> the, the curve actually provides you a lot of warmth. So the, the goal is to kind of just mess around with trying to simulate heat um, radiative mostly because there is no uh, con uh, convective heat, like unless you're on the ground. Um, but that was more for fun, that really wasn't a serious part of the simulation. More importantly, you gotta get cold right. And then, oh, so how do you figure out where you're going to land? So the Cambridge University, a bunch of students there, designed this excellent tool um, called the Flight Predictor, the CUSF Flight Predictor. And you can give it the location you want to launch from, how high you're, or how quickly you're expecting it to excuse me, ascend, and how uh, quickly you're uh, expecting it to descend based on your parachute and the balloon specs you have. Um, and your expected burst altitude, and it takes NOAA wind data, and for every altitude, calculates where it will go, when it will pop, and then where it will land. And it's accurate within like 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers or so, I and mean, it gives you a good idea. Like, if I were to launch from Arcadia, it's not going to go into the ocean. Like, that's, that's a very important thing to know. And they actually designed this because they're in England. They designed this because in England, you're surrounded by water. So when you launch it, it's like you don't want to go out in the water. You want it to make sure if it goes up and comes down, it's going to land on land. Um, but it's a very excellent tool, really, really helpful, uh, and they're constantly expanding on it. So this is where we're going to shift gears to the history of our high altitude balloons. In fact, we have one team member over there, uh, Keith, who came in. Uh, we sent it out to the list, but not everyone can make it. A few of them got stuck at work. Uh, it's a big team, so I'm up here representing a lot of people. I mean, we've had up to 30 people help before um, when we go out to the deserts and do these launches. Uh, and it's always open. I've always left this open. If anyone's ever been interested in helping out, I'm, I've always been open to having people, you know, design and build things and we can throw it in the box and set it up there. So we started off back in 2000, yeah, I think it was around 2009, uh, Havix 1. And I was working on this alone at the time. Uh, and we're, I was trying to design the radio, and I really had no idea about electronics. I was really, really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, and I ended up coming to the Null Space Labs, which I had just opened, the hacker space not too far from here uh, in downtown, and got some help. A bunch of people joined in together, and we, we designed and built this this lunch bag full of LiPo batteries, a 35 watt transmitter, yes, 35 watts. Wow. Um, it is a lot of power, uh, especially at that altitude. Completely, poorly designed. Uh, it had a camera, uh, some antennas, and it was just a basic APRS beacon. So we took this out to the desert, and um, I mailed a, a Jeep Club uh, about this, and I call them a Jeep Club, but they, they do hack and all that fun stuff, too. Uh, and they were interested too, so like a bunch of like, you know, uh, Jeep guys showed up and they're like, we're ready to find this thing, let's go chase it down, it's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> um, we tied it all together, filled it up with helium, this entire thing cost about $1,500 out of my pocket at the time. Uh, and then powered it up, two packets came in, I'm like, this looks great, let's do this, let's launch this thing. Let it go, and above our heads a minute after launch, the radio system completely failed. Oh. Dead silence. And that is the last photo we have of it flying away. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was really sad. It was really difficult. And it really, it, like, I felt horrible. Because, like, all these people had come out and we had put the system together and we had lost it. Um, so I, like, I'm like, I clearly don't know what I'm doing. I'm taking a break. Like, I went on and uh, kind of the team kind of dismembered and we went off and did our own things. But... You want to come back to these things. The failures are where you really learn a lot, and you, you know you need to go out there and learn things and come back to it and then try it again. So we did, and this time we opened up the doors to everyone who ever, or we, we had opened the doors before, but we really went out and asked people, like, do you want to really participate, build something, we'll throw this in the box, whatever you want. So I took um, this, uh, I took priority of building a radio system that is not going to fail. That is what I guarantee to provide. <coughs> And I told everybody else, build your own radios, let's put this all in a box and let it go. So I ended up buying the MicroTrack RTG designed for high altitude balloons, and I just did a huge electronics analysis of it. I mean, I sat down component by component, went through their design, and even wrote up a report and sent it to them. And they're like, what, what are you doing? Like, you, you've done a design analysis of our, our 
radio systems, like they really didn't think that much ahead into what they were doing, but it was actually a really, really well designed system. Um, so I made sure it was gonna work, and I did tests, I made it cold, I ran it on the batteries, I did a bunch of flight tests, like I put all the components that are actually gonna fly, I did test after test after test to make sure it will work on that day. Uh, Ann and Charlie, two guys from Mel Space Labs, also built a cell phone tracker in hopes to, you know, get this to work, have another radio backup system. If it lands in a salt covered area, maybe it might make contact with the tower. Um, Arclight from 23B Hackerspace in Fullerton mm -hmm. built the, RD, uh, the RDF beacon, and they, their team, these guys all have cool four wheel drive vehicles, and they go out and do this sort of stuff for fun anyway, so they built this RDF beacon. They all had their directional antennas, and um, so he provided that radio. Um, Jeremy from our, our hackerspace as well made a, what he called Science Lab, which had temperature sensors, uh, barometer, gyroscope, accelerometer, all that fun stuff. And it logged it to an SD card. And then we had uh, a Canon camera hacked with CHDK, which if I'm not, I think it's Linux or is it just some script? I'm not exactly sure. I didn't, I didn't work on the camera. Uh, Doc Who from our hyperspace built that. And it's just a camera with a hacked firmware. And you can tell it, take a picture every minute, go to sleep, don't waste the, the battery, wake up, take some video for 30 seconds. You can script it to do whatever you want, essentially. So it's a hacked camera, ready to go. So we put that all in a nice, giant pink box you cannot mistake in. Uh, it's, I think it's called like hot pink or whatever blinds you pink. You should. Yes. <laughs> It is very, it's difficult to look at, especially outside. <laughs> um, and we packaged it up, we're ready to go, put it all together, tied a parachute to it, balloon on, let it go. Uh, and it tracked amazingly. We had data the whole way up, everything looked great, and um, we hit, so everyone was traveling along with it, with our radios, chasing it as we go, because we're getting a position report every minute. Um, and as we're driving along to where we had predicted it would land, and we had filled it up so that it would pop and land in a very flat, easy to access spot uh, within, within reason, like within an area of like 10 kilometers or so. So we knew we can get there. But the balloon burst early, and it burst, I want to say, two thirds of the way to the, the expected burst altitude. And it ended up landing in the Turtle Mountains, which is. A, it's a, it's a, I think a preserve, a wildlife preserve or something like that, where you can't have vehicles in there. You're not allowed to drive there, unless you're like some fancy uh, ranger or something like that. But we weren't going to get their help. Um, and we had to pack it up that day. We knew, we, so it had popped, it had come down, and it had fallen in a valley. So there's a bunch of mountains around, and it had fallen below the radio horizon. So we had where it was about a thousand feet off the ground, which is quite a lot. You still won't know where it's going to end up, but that day I saved the entire data of nose, wind, cat, like everything that had to do with wind that day, I have that data from that day. Um, and so I did some interpolation, I did some math, I figured out, okay, well, this is where it could, is likely to have landed based on where, it, uh, based on the winds on that day, um, and then did an error spread. So I knew like within 66% we're in this area. and. Contacted Arclight, who had supplied that RDF beacon, and he's a part of San Bernardino's search and rescue team. And they're like, let's make this a dead body. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they went out, and they actually found it. Nice. Uh, the, the location I estimated it landing, it was only 50 meters left of that, uh, west of it. So it was pretty much dead on where it was. We got it back. Um, and in fact, we got one really good thing out of this we had the balloon back. And that meant we can analyze why it burst early. And thankfully that day, the, and, and this, is, this is the amazing thing about having a cool team of just random people who bring in a lot of things to the table. One of them was just a photographer. The guy just likes doing photos. He took a ton of pictures. They're all online, they're all on my website, so if you want to go see all the pictures, they're there. He happened to take um, HDR photos of the balloon before we let it go. And you can see that there's this white band across it. And that's a manufacturing defect. That part was thinner than the rest of the balloon. And you can see from the balloon we got back that it burst exactly around that perimeter. So this was like, I sent this to the, the balloon company and they're like, okay, well, we'll give you 50% off the next one. I'm like, sure. 
Okay. So I don't go. I don't go with. I don't use Kmart anymore. So let that be on the record. <laughs> There's a good supplier in the UK. Buy from him. Uh, called Ran I think Random Engineer. They, do, they sell great balloons. So I finally got my desktop pictures. This one's blurry. This is not, the, this is not a good one. Um, so I, the one thing I really want to get out of this was cool wallpaper photos. And this is this is actually the Triple Mountains where I ended up landing. Very, very mean terrain. Um, but the pictures came out gorgeous. This one, this is one of my favorites. You can actually see the salt and sea right here. Um, in one of the other photos, there you can see Lake Havasu. It was around that area. So we launched it from 29 Palms, a little near uh, Palm Springs, and it went northeast. So this is where that's where we launched it from. And then we got. So I like this one. This is really great. Right? So you get cool pictures out of it, and it was awesome. It was an excellent experience. We finally got cool pictures, and it's very rewarding, right? But. Now I still wanted to continue. Like I'm like, okay, let's, we got a cool team. We're doing a lot of fun stuff. Uh, we had a conference coming up called Layer One, which is kind of like a computer security hardware hacking conference. Um, not too far from here, by the way. So I would, I'll also advertise that conference. Uh, and they said, well, you know, we got a Saturday afternoon for you. Let's launch a high altitude balloon. Uh, one of the organizers. So I put together, and I had already been building this uh, circuit which was the little small low power uh, GPS tracker, uh, uh, APRS beacon, sorry. So you put that in a styrofoam um, insulated cup and it falls. Some antenna sticking out of it, tied a parachute and uh, a balloon to it. And this was the first time I had designed all the electronics. Like this was mostly just me in terms of the electronics design, but a lot of the launch and recovery team was everybody else. Um, so we launched it from the conference, and a bunch of the Jeep guys decided, all right, let's go get it. And this actually worked great. It Except at the higher altitudes, we think the uh, GPS locked up, and it stopped transmitting. It only was transmitting 00, zero coordinates, which is somewhere south of Africa. <laughs> um, so it's definitely not in Africa. Uh, it, it wasn't working correctly, uh, and we later found out that the microprocessor that was used Oh, I'm sorry, the, um, one of the components uh, interfacing the GPS was not rated for negative 40C, and that had failed, and we weren't getting good GPS data out of it, so it was spin spinning out the default. But when it came down, it warmed up, uh, we tracked it, it had landed in the Mojave Preserve, um, and all our great, uh, the great uh, recovery team drove out there, went on a nice desert hike and found it laying in a nice bush, and we got it back. So I was able to do analysis of the circuit, improve on the design, and right around then, um, this one was just me and uh, Keith, actually. Um, we did a launch from a park not too far from here, um, where I, uh, so the history behind this one. I had a instrumentation class at Cal Poly, and they're like, well, you gotta build something that's a sensor, and you have to make it show us you know, data. Like, okay, well, can I build a high altitude balloon? and capture, you know, uh, atmospheric data, they're like, sure, go for it. So now this, this hobby could become, you know, I could have an excuse to work on this at home and be like I'm doing homework. Um, so I, I designed, the, I took the same design, I, I did a lot more analysis on how to design something to survive colder temperatures, um, and integrated a little sensor on here, this one, which is a barometric and, you know, temperature sensor, the microcontroller would grab the GPS data, the sensor data, put it together, and radio it out. And I actually ended up using the uh, UK modulation with the radio mode for this um, in anticipation for something bigger later. And I wanted to do my own radio system and prove that I could do all the decoding on my own, not rely on the APRS network. So we let it go, and it went up beautifully. Hit the target altitude of about 80,000 feet and then stop transmitting altogether. Oh my crap, I've lost another one. Like that was it, like we had no data after that. So Keith and I drove out, we tried, we took our antennas out, we drove all the way, where did we go? We ended up like, I don't, I don't remember, we went over the San Gabriel Mountains, we went to the other side, like Palmdale Land, where there's deserts and deadly things. And uh, we tried to listen for it, nothing. So packed the bags, went home. The next morning, I get a, I go, I take a shower, and I get back, and I see that there's a missed call, and it's like an area code I don't know. I'm like, okay, well, let's see what this is. 
pull up the voicemail, and there's some guy who's like, I found your science experiment. You want to come pick it up? <laughs> He's like, this is my number, and that's it. And I'm like, oh my god, we're gonna get killed. Like, <laughs> so, um, I took someone with me, just in case, and I went missing, wrote my will, and turns out the guy actually had it, and this is it. It was nice and jumbled up, there was a balloon that with it, but it smells really bad, so I put it in the plastic bag. The parachute, which I don't think actually still, does it say it? Oh, it does. Uh, it says, if found, call this number, Cal Poly Pomona Science Experiment. I'll blame the school. I think we have lawyers. So, you know, if anything bad happened, it was, it was the school's fault. It really isn't. Uh, <laughs> but what I didn't expect was why the guy found it. And it turns out, and I'm not going to mention what company, but the guy, let's say, works for an extremely large power and utility company, and happened to be driving by Kramer Junction around that area, which is a huge power junction in, for Los Angeles, and saw this thing sitting on a power line. And you can actually see the burn marks where it had first made contact. <laughs> um, needless to say, the guy's like, you want to come pick this up, get this from us. Uh, and I'm like, look, I'm not going to tell your identity, we're, we're all cool here. Um, just, I just want it back. Oh, I should mention this. So he was driving by and actually saw it hanging on the power line and did a U-turn. And when he did a U-turn, it was gone. So it turns out he caught it at the last possible second um, and drove up to it and found it lying there on the ground giving me the call and there was a phone number on there. So by pure luck, I got this back. However, the great thing about engineering is knowing why things failed. And it turns out one of the connectors on here for the barometric sensor got knit. This sensor got hit really hard by either the shrapnel from the shredding balloon and it actually popped off one of the connectors and that was just Poorly done on my end. It was 100% my fault. I had done a poor job soldering together a connector, but since then, everything I've built has had excellent connectors. Um, <laughs> so it's like the lessons learned, right? Then came Cubex, which I have, I made two of. This is one of them. It's almost like a little mini satellite, um, and I really did base it on CubeSats. So this consists of several layers. One layer is, so the, the point of it, by the way, was to make it modular, so you could build whatever you want to do. If you want to make a, bit, say, a simple tracker, you stack two boards together, let it go, and off it goes. Um, if you want to send back images while it's flying, now you have something that can do that. So it had a camera, um, the same microcontroller, 18 mega 328, a GPS module, a radio module, which was actually tunable, so we can do the UK frequencies, it can do um, the US frequencies, and based on where it is, where it knows, like you can region lock and geofence certain frequencies. So if it traveled into the into Canada or into the UK, it would automatically switch frequencies and properly um, uh, configure itself. And then added solar panels and a solar charging circuit here. So you could plug in a battery, a LiPo battery to the back, and some solar panels. And as it's flying along, it's actually charging and topping off its batteries. As the batteries start going low because it's nighttime, um, it's smart enough to know that and then stops transmitting stuff and decreases the frequency of transmission to, to survive the night. And the beauty of this was that it could send back live pictures as it's flying. So you don't even need to recover it if you really don't want to, although it is a bit expensive. Um, so what we did was the next layer one just happened to be coming around. And I tested the system. Here's actually a nice waterfall where you can see one frequency and another. It's quickly switching back and forth between them. And that is being fed into DLFL Digi, which is doing all the packet decoding. And then you can see the cool image that is generated from this one. You can only see a bit of it just in my hand uh, from those doing the test. So we tied this little high altitude balloon, um, and we let it go. And we got images, lots and lots of images coming down. Uh, however, that day, the conference day, which we cannot move and we cannot change the location or the day, um, happened to have southern winds. And no matter what we did, it would end up in the water. But everything was already paid for, it was already designed, I built two, so I had another one. Um, and we decided, well, there's a small chance it could land on Catalina, who cares? Like, we've already paid for everything, we might as well let it go. Because we're still gonna get all the images and all the data anyway, so once it lands, it's just having the hardware back. Um, we let it go, and it went up, did everything perfectly. It was the first time we broke 100,000 feet. 
We finally broke into near space, uh, and uh, it crashed into the ocean. So somewhere deep in, under the Pacific, but before it died, it sent us fantastic photos. It was very, it's like a low resolution camera that Adafruit sells. Um, if you guys are not familiar with Adafruit, they sell like little electronic trinkets. Um, but it had, it, it sent back excellent photos. You get that, you know, space effect with the dark black background of space and earth and nice clouds. Um, and it was a real, the, the big deal here was actually being able to prove a radio system, being able to prove that we can design something that can um, send a lot of data and provide useful information. And this provided exactly that. And it was actually a collaboration of not only people from Null Space Labs, but a few people from uh, the UK, Northern Ireland and uh, England, uh, who wrote the code for the camera and did some forward error correction so we can actually get corrupted packets to be able to reconstruct them and, and, and correct them and uh, get that information back. So this was cool, but now it got to the, a, a big thing started trending in the Hab world, which is not a huge world, it's a couple hundred people. Um, and that was floating balloons. Um, this one guy in the UK named Leo, uh, who we'll get into in, in a bit, he's been building these house to balloons that you underfill and you float, and they, he was able to get them to go from like the UK to the Netherlands and then to France. So I'm like, this is awesome. And he happened to just send me one of his uh, trackers, and I just taped it up to a AAA battery. I'm like, oh, this is pretty easy. You know, this is a, an afternoon. So me and another guy, Dave, who's, who's not here today, uh, we went out to the Rose Bowl, and we had filled this up at Null Space Labs. It's Null Space Labs. And it was a basic party balloon, like a Mylar balloon. Um, I actually had to get lawyers for this, by the way. Uh, I had one lawyer I, I consulted with to make sure I could launch this, because California actually has a Mylar balloon law where you're not allowed to launch Mylar balloons because they get stuck on power lines and they knock out things and it's, it's a horrible mess. However, if you are scientific research, you are allowed to launch them. And, and most of the regulation is around the sails, not so much the letting go of one. Um, so I was able to do the flight, uh, tie it to no parachute, just tie this to the uh, Mylar balloon and let it go. And much to my surprise, um, oh. It went really far, so I was like, I'll be happy if it floats. And it turned out, it floated really well. I'm like, oh, excellent, it's floating. We went out to the pub and got some beers, and like, that was great. Went to sleep. Woke up, and it was in Arizona. And I was like, wow, I can't believe this thing's actually still going. Like, how, how much further can it go? And uh, it was, what's really interesting here in the data, you can see, as it's going up, it, 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 it starts floating, it becomes buoyant, but we launched it at night. And then when the sun rose, it actually gained altitude as it warmed up, and the balloon slightly expanded, gaining altitude. However, so this is kind of hard to coordinate where the data is, but it flew over Arizona, Albuquerque, and then once it passed through the Rockies, it hit a huge storm. And to give you an idea of how much lift this balloon has, I mean, you can see in this photo, it's not, very, it's not filled very high. I mean, this thing has enough to lift a penny and a half, and that's about it. Like that is the amount of net cliff required to uh, get it to float. So a little bit of rain, I mean, if you took a teaspoon of rain of water and just dribbled it on the uh, balloon, it would sink. So it got rained on and sank down, but then the water evaporated and then it went back up. Then it got rained on again, and then it took off again. Um, <laughs> a fun story is I actually have a friend in, in Denver and the, the night off, I'm like, Dude, it landed here. We have a good idea of where it is. Tomorrow morning, can you go get it? He's like, yeah, all right, this is awesome. I got a new Jeep, too. I'm like, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up in the morning to a text with a frowny face. Oh, I took off again. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt really bad for him, but at the same time, I was excited. So I'm like, awesome, we can keep going. And it, it went on, and it lasted another day. It flew through Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, I think. Yeah. yeah. What's the scale on that altitude plot? Oh, oh, good question. This is at, I don't, everything I think of is in metric. It's about 8,000 meters, so it's like a little bit of like 16,000 feet, 15,000 feet or so. I think I'm doing the math right in my head. Wait. 26,000 feet. Yeah, 26, yeah, 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 that sounds right, okay. Um, so that, that, that's about, about here. So that, this is from 6,000 meters to about 8,000 meters or so in variation. Yeah. Now, other people figured out, and we, we had, theorize about this uh, within the HAB community that 
you should be above 12,000 kilometers, which is where clouds stop forming. So you are no longer influenced by weather. You're just influenced by the pressure changes and the sunlight and all that stuff. So you just fly over everything and you don't have to worry about getting rain on. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, here's a cool Google, Google Earth view. And in fact, I kind of see the thick line going across and then shrinking and, and kind of landing here and then taking off again, um, flying towards Minnesota. And then when it got to Minnesota, uh, it got rained on again. And this time, the battery we knew was near its death. It was just a AAA. There's no rechargeability on this. We were surprised it had lasted this long. No one had actually flown this, this piece of electronics that long. It had all this power saving code on it. So it's like, boot up the GPS, which takes up a bunch of power, quickly grab the position, report it out, go back to sleep. Um, so it's very, very well-written code on conserving the power, but it lasted quite a long way. And it landed somewhere in Finland, Minnesota. Um, such a small city that I emailed everyone in the town. Like, I just went through, like, any online resource I could find. It was like a restaurant, a gas station, a few other things. I'm like, you guys gotta find it. Nothing. I never heard back from anyone. They probably think I'm some, like, crazy guy talking about spaceships landing in their, in their town. <laughs> um, and then, but we got great data. APRS, um, thankfully, this, this payload provided temperature data and voltage and all this sort of stuff. So we got cool data out of it. We could see um, when nightfall hit, uh, when it got rained on, it hit a really cold front, the temperature dipped down. It's kind of hard to see from over there. We can watch the battery even fluctuate in voltage with temperature because batteries aren't perfect. They don't stay at the exact temperature. So that was really cool. Um, but his, Leo's payload, that, so that wasn't my payload, that was actually someone else's that I just flew, uh, inspired me to design my own, and I brought that today. Um, this small little guy has a GPS, a microcontroller, and then the radio, and then down below it is a charging circuit. So the solar panels, uh, there's no battery on this yet, which will sit on the back. These solar panels will pick up the power um, from the sun, charge the batteries as it's flying along, and it has all this logic inside that handles making sure the battery doesn't deplete all the way, because a big problem is if your batteries dip below a certain voltage, you can really do some damage and even kill the battery completely um, by draining it too much. So this is this hasn't been launched yet. This is the, the only model of it, actually, right now. Um, this is going to be the next one. I've been so busy recently that I haven't had a chance, but I'm hoping sometime in July of spinning up this, uh, this balloon again and hopefully getting more people involved and have people build their own and mess with the code. So that's today. Um, one, an honorable mention is Leo. He has launched 66 balloons of these type of floating balloons. And his most recent one has gone around the world now on its eighth time. <laughs> he, he grew, like, go, if you go to his website, it's insane. This guy actually, and I, and I visited him when I was up, uh, up in England uh, just a few months ago. I went to his lab, and he has been chemical processing these mylar balloons, ripping off the aluminum off of the surfaces to prevent solar radiation from affecting the altitude. He built his own custom envelopes, and uh, his own custom balloons, and calculated so that they would fly just above the, the jet stream, just above airliners and everything else, and above weather. And he, he's mastered it. Like, he's gotten this down where now this, this has been flying. It's flying right now, by the way. If you go to his website, there's a link to the, the tracker. It's somewhere over Turkey right now, and it's still going. It's been more than 100 days. So it's like, if, if this sort of stuff is interesting, like this has gone way beyond. Um, the, the UK is definitely has a lot of people who do altitude balloons. It's much more popular there than here. And I'm, I'm near the end here, but I figured this is a Linux user group. What is a Windows user doing here? Um, I thought I'd mention something. My, uh, good friends Dave and Anthony in the UK designed called Pi in the Sky. Um, and this is a great attachment for the Raspberry Pi. I'm totally plugging their product for free here. They didn't even tell me to do this. Um, it is just a really basic circuit where you plug in a battery. Uh, it has the GPS, it has the flight mode on there, it has the radio, and it even has a slot to let you plug in a camera. And all the software is handled for you. So you can, and you can modify it, it's all open source. This whole thing is all open source. And even include, they actually designed one for the new Raspberry Pi that just came out this week, the Plus model. Um, and this, this device will allow you to take a picture with the camera and send it down over the radio along with the GPS data. 
So definitely a cool product. It's expensive, in like 190 bucks is quite a lot of money, you'd think. But that's actually really cheap for what it does. Like very cheap if you were to do it on your own. Um, and it handles everything for you. It's a really cool project. I definitely recommend following it. I think they're available now, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, and if you want something a little less complicated, there's also Hadduino. So if you have an Arduino, there's just a shield you smack on top of this. This is if you want to get started and you don't really know electronics, but you still want to do high altitude balloons, these are awesome. Um, both of these are, are great little devices. You can stop together and have fun and hack with it because it's all open source. I think that's it. What about um, your links? My links? Oh! <laughs> you said you were going to give them at the end. We call it, we call it. <laughs> oh, hey, look at all my tabs. Oh, there's nothing here. I'm being you. stupid. Okay. Oh, uh, where's the mouse? It's only about a fifth of what I got. Yeah. <laughs> you can uh, post it to the meetup group if you email it. Oh, can I? Okay, yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll email it out. I'll, I'll, in fact, tonight I'll post it on my Twitter too, so whatever. I'll try to get all those links up there. I'm sorry, I completely forgot about that. I made this slideshow like last night. I'm, I'm really bad. I didn't even rehearse, so I hope I wasn't too. You did a great job. Right. Okay. Sorry, um, like... But yeah, so I guess I'll open up the questions. Did you use an external antenna for the GPS or a PCB trace? Um, I ended up using both. Um, in the beginning, where is it? Somewhere here. Yeah, that so we had an ex external GPS antenna and that was hooked up to this system. But after that, um, Habix Pico 1 ended up having this hydrofiller antenna. And it was actually an active antenna. So it applied a voltage to it to really get a good GPS lock. Um, and then since then, it's become a chip antenna. I don't know where the floats are. Yeah, so you can see like this little tiny dot, uh, this little white dot there. It's a nice little chip antenna that's tuned to 1.5 gigahertz for GPS. Are your designs open source? Yes, they're all online. Uh, they're on uh, hackaday.io. I have like a Cubex project on there. Um, so all this stuff is on my GitHub, which I will also put in the links. So you can, if you want, go ahead. I, in fact, I may have extra PCBs. If you want to buy the parts, you're more than welcome to put it together yourself. I don't sell them. Most of the guys within this community don't sell them mostly because the radio frequencies are ham radio frequencies, and they don't want just anybody getting them and then launching them and then stomping over each other. And also, it's fun to build it, so, yeah. yeah. So yeah. the, um, uh, I guess in the Cold War, we were, when we were flying balloons over the Soviet Union, uh, my understanding is that they had some sort of valve or something that allowed them to adjust their ballast. Yes. So they would stay it out. Is there any amateur work doing that type of thing? There isn't, but, there, there's two people right now that are trying to do that in the amateur world. In the professional world, absolutely. In fact, there's actually a bladder that inflates and deflates. Um, Google Luna, I don't know if you guys have heard of that, they have an insane system where it's a balloon and inside of it is a bladder. They use a turbo molecular pump to actually pump in air to fill it up and change the volume so it actually, they're able to put in air or push out air to control the exact altitude um, and in fact, if you know all the wind data, you can say, oh, drop a few thousand feet, we can catch this, you know, drift and take us over to where we want it to go. So you can do some guidance. Right now in the amateur world, it's not being done, but if you could do it, that is awesome. Like, I would highly encourage anyone to try. Um, we might try it once we master floating and go around the world a few times. So, so Leo's floats are, are just mylar balloons? Yeah, uh, they are mylar uh, what he does is he actually purchases the mylar uh, sheets, takes off all the foil, and then uses a heat sealer and puts it together. Can I just buy a polyester sheet without the mount, go out there and weld them on first? Uh, I don't know the exact reason for that. That's a good question. Um, there's also, also if you're on Freenode, Hash High Altitude is an excellent channel. Um, a lot of guys there, most of them are in the UK, so right now it's really quiet. Or actually, most of them are in Europe. Um, but there's like 10 of us Americans on there and every now and then we're, you know, we're more active. Um, but if you do, that, that's a great question. Leo's actually in that IRC channel, you can ask him yourself. Um, I don't know the, the actual answer for that. With the Mylar balloon, how do you know how much air to put into it? I mean, there's some sort of trade-off, right? If it's too you, much, it'll go too high. You don't put any air in it. You only fill it with the lifting gas. Um, because, uh, you put enough lift, like usually these things start off flat, like nothing's in, like the air in there is negligible. 
Um, and then you put in um, your, your filling tube, let it fill up, and sometimes they don't even fully inflate like you saw in the other pictures. Like, they don't actually fill up completely. Hope I got your question right here. So that you can see, like, it, it, there's actually still flat spots in it, but as it goes up, it expands and. Uh, right, you just sort of take a, a guess at how much. Oh! Fill. No. Um, it's very, very. It's actually really difficult to do. What, I, what, I, what we ended up doing was I actually. Um, there's these. I don't know if you guys have ever filled up mylar balloons, but it has like a little hole in the neck. Uh, and uh, what we did was. We take it all up, we had uh, the payload, we knew the mass of it, we weighed it on a very sensitive scale, we knew it was like a few grams. We even measured the mass of the string holding it, and what we ended up doing was we tied um, a, a way down to it and set it on a scale, and we kept filling it up until it lifted that mass just enough so that the scale reads a little bit lighter, then we knew exactly how much neck lift it has. And there's an Excel sheet online that you can, um, the, the HAB community is provided where you can actually say, I need, like, I want to float at this altitude, I have this balloon, and it goes, okay, well, you need to fill it up and have a neck lift of 2.5 grams. And then you know how much to fill up your balloon and how much neck lift, exact neck lift, neck lift to get. And as long as you know your payload mass, you tie it on, let it go, and you hope the thing floats. Any other questions? So. Tell everyone the bond rate of the RTTY that you're transmitting. The oh, the images? It was 600 baud, which <laughs> is slow. It took 20 minutes okay. to get a single photo. No, no, five minutes per photo. Like, yeah, so, yeah, we were, <laughs> we were at the conference and like, everyone had the antennas, like Keith had his antenna, he had his own setup, and I had uh, I had my own team of like people, like I was on the computer and they're like pointing the the antenna around, and like the balloons moving around, like oh, I'll go over by the pool, a little bit to the left. Like you're just trying to get a good lock on that signal because it's a lot of data at a very low power, so you need to be very accurate in your receiving. So yeah, it was, it was a very very slow ball, right? Well, man, I've gone completely over time. Thank you. Oh, okay. You, you kept us all wrapped with it. So Fantastic. I don't think that's a problem. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I, I have a question. Sure. You're using a software defined radio receiver? Yes. Which one are you using? I use a bunch. Um, I use the RTL USB, which is a very common, like, cheap $20 little thing. But the front end on that is horrible. Like, you, I, I once was, was actually tuning around on it, and I picked up K Rock on the, state, on the frequency because. It was a perfect harmonic of the frequency I was trying to transmit. Oh, oh, oh. So these, so a good SDR, it's really important to have proper filtering and a good front end. So I ended up um, going to TourCon two years, four years ago now, three years ago, I don't remember. They gave out HackRFs to all the attendees. So I got a HackRF now, and I've been using the HackRF, um, and it's been excellent. It has a fantastic front end, and the FPGA, it's all open source. You can write your own modules to even do the decoding on board if you really want to. Um, but if you're really rich, you can get the USRPs, which are very, very fancy and very nice, made by uh, Edis Research. Very uh, expensive. Very expensive, but you can do cool stuff with like cell phones and stuff if you really want to. Do you know, does like the, the laws change if you start introducing things that allow you to steer and control? Right? Yes, uh, you are not allowed to control these in any way uh, other than. Like basic, like it's it's a gray area in a lot of ways. If you wanted to do a controlled hab, you can, but you have to go through the proper channels again in FAA waiver. So I didn't go into this. In fact, this talk is a completely condensed version of three other talks I had that I kind of just glued together. Uh, in one of the talks, I talk about the laws regarding this. Um, if you're under, if your payload mass is under four pounds and you follow a few of the Part 101 FAA laws on, on these sort of things. Um, you don't have to tell the FAA, you just build it and let it go and have fun. Um, but if you go above six pounds, if you try to do guidance, which is in a way possible, people have done gliders and things. Um